20 to 11. We're finally getting to the games that are almost not trash. Yeah, we're, we're close to the good games. Snick and Mike's top 100 games. But does anyone care what they have to say? Please. I know I don't. Cause they may die, they might scream, they may say some things that are plain wrong. Dab on it, dab on it. But they are dumb, dumb bing bongs. Matthew Juice better. <laughs> What's up, everybody? My name is Nick. I'm Mike. We are the Brothers Murphed, and we are to our 20 to 11. We are going through our top 100 games, each having our top 100 list. If you have not watched the other many videos, please go watch those as well, and follow along with us. People have been putting their list down in the comments, hopefully, and uh, that is super, super cool. We love yeah. to see that kind of stuff. Keep those going, and we uh, want to let you know that we are running a crowdfunding campaign yes. to support this very channel that you are watching. Yeah. If you get any sort of value out of uh, what we do here, and have a couple extra bucks to spare. Uh, we'd love your support. It helps us pay for our studio space, which we are building and moving into as we uh, yeah. are saying this to you right yes, now. Yes, indeed. Uh, and it'd be really cool. And we have a couple of games, including a, a new 18-card uh, micro game yeah. with art by Beth Sobel that you can buy if you That's want a little cool. something in return. Uh, and thanks so much. So do check that out in the description of this video or a card right here. And I think we should get to our top 20, man. Let's do I'm it. I'm getting proper excited now. I know, right? All right, all right, my number 20. Oh, can, oh do you mind if I get a, like, a sip of coffee? Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry, sorry, I just want to wet my whistle here. Hey, how you doing? This is uh, Mike. You're coming from the perspective of my coffee cup right now, and uh, I'd really like some coffee, but I can't sip it until you subscribe. So let's do a little subscribe and sip situation, okay? You ready? Three, two, one. Uh, uh, oh, oh, oh. Just for the record, this is what this looks like. Yeah, that's it's movie magic, man. It's that. I mean, <laughs> it's not I, a phone taped to a coffee cup. With this a, is how they made Titanic, <laughs> man. So if you're wondering, technology. like, man, did the Brothers have high technology? No, we sure do. I need my phone because my top 10 is a little Oh, yeah. <laughs> Out of the way, my number 20 is going to be a game that I think would have been my top 100, but I don't think it would be anywhere near this high if we didn't just have legit one of the best gaming experiences ever with it. This is King of 12. Wow, yeah, that propelled it a lot. Well, then. first of all, I, a great game. I love King of 12, yeah. and I, I maintain it. You've probably, been a champion for a while. Yeah, I've been championing this game for a while, but we, this is kind of, there's always recency bias with any list, and this is one where, like, we just at Star West had such a good play of this. This is this game where you are going to be rolling out a D12, and you want to have, generally, the highest value die possible. That's not much of a game right there, but you have all these cards. Everyone has the same cards, and everyone on the, every turn will choose a card, simultaneous selection, will choose a card to play, and then flip it over. And these cards will usually do something to your dice. They could physically change your die, like you can turn it over to one of the other sides. So if you have like a one, that might be next to like a 10, you can like turn it to the 10 side, hopefully increase your value. They can virtually increase your value, like this adds plus seven to this die. You're not actually gonna change the die, but just for this particular turn, you have a plus seven. You basically wanna have the highest one. If you do, you're gonna win that little round, that's great. So uh, you basically are gonna get points. You wanna have the most points at the end of the round. But this game is all about being unique. You want to not right. match with anyone in any way because if two people play the same card, those two cards cancel each other out. If three people play the same card, all three of those just cancel each other out. If at the end of that little round, two people have the same value, like say we both have 11, we cancel each other out. Um, at the end of the whole round, when you're trying to see who win, wins the entire round, uh, you want to win two rounds to win the game. That's kind of how you win. If two people have the exact same score, they are out. And so there's all this stuff of like wanting to not be the same as anyone else. You want to choose a unique card, have a unique value, all this stuff. So there's And everyone has the same cards. So there's just this constant like anxiety around it of like, oh gosh, I'm, I'm gonna play this card. Is someone else gonna play the same card? Cause then we're gonna cancel each other out and then I'm left with a freaking four. And on top of that, there's one card that you always play with called the knight. And the knight basically means if someone plays the knight and it doesn't get canceled by someone else playing a knight, it basically means that for this round, the lowest value is gonna be the one that gets the point. And so there's always this anxiety of everyone's like, is someone gonna play the knight? Should I should yeah. I take because one of the cards is like you can minus your die by seven. So you're like, should I do that now? Because I think Mike's gonna play the knight. <laughs> it becomes this whole thing. And we play this game at so we've been big champions for this game for a while. I freaking love this game. We played this game at Dice Star West recently with our good friend Shea Bay and then Jabs. 
and we had one of the best gaming experiences I've ever had, Agreed. ever. It was so much fun, and it was so fun to see them love the game and understand why we like it so much. But this one basically ended where uh, everyone but me, so Mike, Shay and Jabs had all won a round. Again, to win the game, you need to win two rounds total. They had all won a round. And at this point, uh, it was basically at the end of the, this round, Shay and Jabs had the same amount of points. Mike had the, the, the next lowest. And they both went, well, what happens if we have the same amount of points? And Mike just goes, oh, you cancel each other out. And so then Mike ended up winning because he ended up having the next lowest. So that's one thing about the game is like and I so won that round with one point, by the way. Yeah, with I one was point. Not in contention for the round otherwise. At all. But that's the fun <laughs> thing is like sometimes you're like, oh, I just won with like a six this this like turn. I just won like a six. That's yeah. great. And they just started laughing so hard. And it was like, oh yeah, that's why this game is so good. It's because there's so many of those moments. I really like King of 12. I think it would have been on my top 100, maybe my top 50 anyway, but it definitely got bumped up because we just had legit one of the best gaming experiences of my life. It was so much fun playing that game. I, really I love King of 12. Give it a shot. No one knows about the game. No one talks about it. It's just, it's really good. It's my number yeah. 20. That's a great pick, man. I, I think, you know, any game that can create those large gaming experiences, those yeah. large memory moments is, is awesome. And that was such a fun play. My number 20 is uh, essentially the same game, maybe a little heavier. This is Anachrony. Basically, wow, most of the yeah, same. That's good. Most of the same, but a little bit Basically heavier. Basically the same game. Anachrony is a big old game. It's a big worker placement uh, Euro game. Yeah. Which, of course, is something that I really like a lot. Um, and this one deals with timey-wimey time travel stuff. Uh, and and this kind of impending apocalypse. At some point in the game, the basically, uh, the world's going to end. And, and yeah. you need yeah. to start escaping and stuff sure. like that. Sure. Um, but this one is really interesting in that you are basically going to be... Porting yourself resources from round to round, if you want, you can basically drop some resources into the current timeline, but at some point in the future, you need to go back in time and essentially pay back those resources so that it sort of, you know, corrects itself. You don't have anomalies and things like that. That's just kind of an interesting, you know, thing, and it's ultimately a tight resource kind of game where it's just like resources are scarce. You want to take your your workers and put them in these mech suits to go out to the main board and stuff, but you need like water and things to, to be able to do this, and everything's kind of really expensive. And you're hoping to basically complete these projects, build yeah. these tiles, these types of buildings and stuff, which might give you income, uh, just scoring stuff, wor additional worker placement spaces where you can use your workers on your player boards. So they don't have to go out in those mech suits and be powered up and stuff. Yeah. Um, and all sorts of things like that. This is one that like... I was so intimidated by for the longest time. Yeah, yeah I still is, am, yeah. It is a big, heavy game. But it's, you know, it's really, I kind of found that the, the weight of it comes into, like, the resources are really tight. You're not yeah. going to have a, an abundance of things necessarily. So how do you kind of, you know, be really efficient with all of that? And once you kind of have played it a few times, you start to realize how you can kind of work those engines a little better and manage your workers and stuff and, and have them, you know, because they kind of go back and they, they are... Uh, they sleepy and they go to rest and things, Makes but there's certain ways you can bring them back so that they're ready to go, or yeah. you can wake up your workers. There's a lot of fun things to uh, do, and this is just one that I've really enjoyed. You know, mostly from being able to play on board game arena, yeah. learning how the game kind of works and figuring out how to to do more with my game. Because the first game I played, I felt like I did nothing. I had no resources. Right. And it's been fun to kind of grow with the game. Um, it's got kind of a cool, yeah. wild theme to boot, which yeah, is cool. uh, extra fun. So my number 20 is Anachrony. My number 19 is a cooperative trick-taking game called The Crew Mission nice. DC. Uh, it's so good. Uh, it's a great game. Uh, we uh, don't get to play it enough just because of player count stuff, yeah. but it, we both really enjoy trick-taking. You've seen other trick-taking games on our list yeah. before this. Um, and... This is one that, you know, really, we had heard stuff about the first version of the crew. The one I'm referencing, Mission Deep Sea, is the newest version of the crew. Largely the same, but it does help with player scaling a little bit uh, better in terms of the tasks you're completing. Right. But in this game, you're cooperatively doing trick-taking. So in a normal trick-taking game, you have to, uh, you know, whoever leads the card plays a, a certain suit. And most of the time, if you have that suit, you must follow suit and play the same suit. 
Uh, and here you're doing that kind of standard trick taking stuff, but you have specific tasks that everyone, you know, uh, depending on the level of the challenge has been yeah. assigned to. And it might be that, you know, uh, you have to win one of the first three tricks or, and I have to take the blue seven yeah. or whatever it might be. And so now we're having to play out our cards in such a way that we make sure the right people get the right things at the right time to complete their tasks. And that's how we succeed in this mission to be able to move on to a more difficult mission in the future. Um, I really, I, I fell in love with trick taking by playing spades, you know, just yeah. a classic card trick taking game uh, with a standard deck of cards. And back then you're playing with a partner and you really learn how to communicate about your cards yeah. via the play. You can't obviously say what you have in your hand. Of course that would not, break yeah. All trick taking games. So you have to kind of play certain things to try to communicate and manipulate what's going on. And there's kind of a language that gets developed with yeah. that. And so the crew is really cool because it allows you, or rather you're encouraged to share that kind of knowledge that, and, and kind of teach each other if someone's a little more advanced than the other one uh, about that kind of how to communicate with those cards, how to manipulate stuff so that you contain, you remain in control of yeah. the cards and I get to play first or make sure that you're throwing under so that you don't have to maintain control right. so that you can throw away cards or yeah. whatever it might be. And the crew, since it's a cooperative game, I'm inclined to share with you what I was trying to say by playing a card because yeah. we have the same goal. If I'm playing competitively, maybe I don't want to share that yeah. knowledge because I want to exploit that and win. Uh, and that's been really fun. So the crew mission Deep Sea just helps scale for player count in yeah, terms of like better. a certain task will be more difficult at a certain player count than others. And so it's a little more dynamic in that yeah. way, which helps with the balancing issue of uh, your player count. And I just always really like trick taking. So that's as simple as that. The crew is my number 19. Awesome. My number 19 uh, is a new game that I am very, very into. You've heard me talk about it a ton recently. This is Kutna Aura, the City of Silver. Yeah, dude. I really like Kutna Aura a lot. I am, it's, it's my number one game that I'm just like, always want to play, can't stop thinking about. Like, I really, really enjoy it. Um, this is a game, uh, kind of like an economic game, where you are building up this City of Silver, Kutna Aura, and uh, you're doing that by building these buildings kind of out in the city, but every single person basically has different guilds that they're a part of, and right. only they, and each of these buildings pertains to a guild. So there's like the wood guild, and like the, the mining guild, all this kind of stuff. So if I have the wood guild, and I'm the, I'm, in, depending on the player count, you might be the only person with that guild. Um, well actually, I think there's always one other person who has the same stuff as you, but basically, you can only build buildings from guilds that you have. You can't build any other kinds of buildings so there's like this kind of interesting thing where you're always having to build those things. And then you can also mine, which will get you coal and you can kind of get like a little bit of area control down in the mine area. But where so much of this comes down to that I love is just like the kind of market. The market is constantly changing because right. as the city is growing, the population is growing, which means the demand for all of these various resources that are attached to these guilds goes up. The more you build buildings for that, that means you're putting resources into the market, which means the price of those resources are probably going to go down. Um, and so there's just a lot of like manipulating that kind of market like that, hopefully in a way that helps out you. Because the whole point of this game is trying to get money for the most part. Yeah. It's the city of silver. And one thing I like about the game, because it just makes everything really, really clean, is everything is just money. So if you ever need to pay five wood, you will just pay money. You don't ever have like wood bits. You don't have like bits for coal or anything like that. You just look at what the market value is right now. And again, that will change. Say the market value right now is three and I need five wood. I need to pay 15 bucks because it's three times five. So as again, if you build a building with wood, it might put more wood into the market and it might bring the price down. If the city is increasing and the, the population goes up, the price for wood is gonna increase. And so it's this constant balance of kind of trying to keep the price of these things where you want them. Because one of the main things you'll do on your, uh, one of the main actions you can do on your turn is an income action, which basically means whatever the price is for your guild, um, the price for that resource is, you'll times that by basically how many steps up you've moved on that little guild track. So if I moved with like five times and the price is like six right now, I'm gonna get 30 bucks for that. That's a ton of money. Yeah. And so it's this interesting concept of the way the money works and I just absolutely love it. It's very, very Euro game. Uh, but I do love the way the look it looks inside the box. I will say I'm not a huge fan of the cover of the game, but the inside the box is like really, really pretty. I just think this game is outstanding. Um, I really, really enjoy it. And uh, yeah, it's really high up because I'm still at this point super, super high on it. Nice. That's number 19. Good choices, my man. Uh, let's hop into 18. 
Number 18 is also kind of a newer game, and this is going to be Sky Team. This is a uh, oh, nice. two-player yeah. two player cooperative game where you are trying so to land a plane. Yeah, this game is just... Every time I play this game, I'm just so impressed. And I still have not really even gotten into many of the modules. I've gotten very, very few, because I'm always teaching this game, I feel like, so I end up playing the base game. But Sky Team is a game, it's a two-player cooperative game where you are trying to land a plane. You're just trying to land a normal plane. Um, easy. Easy peasy. I maintain I could if I got in the cockpit and the, you know, the fish had killed the pilot or whatever, like airplane yeah. and stuff. I feel like I could land it. I, I've always, what I've always heard is that it's easy to fly a plane. It's hard to land a plane. That's, <laughs> That's the fair. tricky part. That's fair. So in this case, we're landing, though. So you have the pilot and the co-pilot, and basically what's going to happen is you're going to kind of talk about what you want to get done on this turn, and then you're going to roll four dice behind your little screen, and then one by one, without talking, you're going to be basically placing these dice out on different sparts, spots on the board, which, again, is all different things that have to do with landing a plane. So you... Um, can move the plane forward, which means you're flying through the air, right? You can um, change the tilt of the plane. You can open up flaps. You can op get like the the ready the um, the brake ready to go. You can um, get all put the landing gear kind of down because again you're getting ready to land here. And so basically, what's going to happen is you put out this dice, and then there's certain spots where each person has to play a die every single round and that's gonna be the engine and then the tilt you have to play to your dice there and so there's a lot of different ways to lose because you have a certain amount of time that you have to land this plane by or else you're gonna like overshoot the um the uh airport or you're just gonna crash early or something like that so you can't move too fast too far forward too quickly you have to keep your tilt you can like tilt all the way over that's another way you can lose when you actually land you need to make sure that your uh, brakes are engaged so you don't like have a brake failure and it's like smashed to a wall or something there's all <laughs> these different ways you can like lose the game um and you just have to work together but again you're putting out these dice without talking so you're kind of like i'm gonna put a six out on the engine we need to move not we need to not move that much. Hopefully you have a low die to put out because once you roll your die, you can't talk. It's just really, really fun. And then there's all these modules that add like all of these different things you can do in the game. It's crazy. Different airports that you're landing at that all have different challenges and stuff. I just think it's a masterpiece of design. It's so cool. It's so different. And it's just, it's just very, very fun. That's a good pick, man. Yeah, I really, I played one recently with like kerosene leak. So you're having to manage like your fuel. Nuts. It's like another spot. You have to put a die out and it's like, oh, it's so fantastic. Um... My number 18 is continuing in my Euro game uh, goodness now that we're at the top of this list. This is going to be Zulk in the Mayan calendar. Ooh, yeah. Uh, this is a game uh, where you are... It's one of the more unique yeah. uh, games out there. It, it looks like this big gimmick and stuff, but it actually is really cool because you basically have this board with a giant uh, set of interconnected cogs that are going to be rotating. There's like this main cog in the middle which will rotate every round. Uh, meaning everyone's taking a turn, and then that, that will kind of time out the game. And then all of the cogs that are connected to it are places where you can place your workers out. Yep. On your turn, you either place one or more workers, or you can remove one or more workers from these cogs. Uh, and when you place workers out, you might have to pay uh, corn and stuff, so you're kind of managing your food. Uh, and then they hop on the gear and go on a little ride. And as they stay, the longer in general on all these cogs, the longer they stay on their little carousel, mm -hmm. the stronger the actions become yep. when you decide to pull your workers off of the uh, off of the cogs. And you are doing this thing to uh, gain more corn uh, and building resources so you can feed your people uh, and you can build buildings. There are technologies you can develop. Uh, there are temple tracks you can go up. This is the same designer who made like Teotihuacan. So if you're familiar with like board and dice games and all the temple tracks and stuff, Zulkin was kind of you know one of the first ones that really ushered in in these. It's a, a tea game without being a board and dice tea game. Yeah, right. Uh, and uh, it's really all about that timing. It's about like again on your turn you must add one or more workers to gears or remove one or more workers. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of like play that ebb and flow. Yeah. And make sure that you can stay on the cog for as long as you you know yeah, need, need to, to get yeah. to the right action space, so you can then gain you know some stone or gold or whatever to build these buildings. The buildings will give you all sorts of things. They might give you those temple advancements. They might give you uh, you know some farmers and stuff, so it's easier to feed your people at the kind of four interim scoring mm -hmm. moments. Uh, they might give you advancements in your technologies. Your technologies will give you kickbacks. So now when you gain 
uh, wood, for example, at any of the possible spots you gain wood, you gain an extra wood. So you start to get better uh, results. There's this uh, crystal skull cog where basically the longer you ride on that, you can drop off the yep. skull, the further you get more temple advancements, more points. Yep. And then at those interim scorings, where you are in those temples will reward you resources or points and stuff like that. Uh, and you're just trying to do that. So this is a game that's so awesome because the turn structure is so simple. It really, it's like put a worker, take a worker. That's, that's all you can it. do. Put workers or take workers. Yeah. But it's a really, again, similar to Anachrony, which you mentioned a couple of turns ago, very tight on the resources. Yeah. You're not going to have a ton of them, so you really have to kind of time it all out and stuff and like make sure if I have, like most of my workers are out on the cogs and I really need them to all go one more turn. It's like, well, I don't have any workers to place, yeah. so I have to remove one. Like, which one do I move, remove yeah. just so I can get to the next turn where I can really take my big turn or whatever? It's just awesome. The whole timing mechanism, the fact that these gears uh, facilitate you know, where you are and what actions you have access to is just super cool yeah. and really unique. Uh, and so I haven't had a game, you know, that really is interested in the timing of everything quite like Zulkin, and that is why it's on my list. It's just yeah. great. Number yeah. 18. All right, number 18. Let's get number 17. True crossover? True crossover. Maybe. I feel like mine's going to be higher on your list, but go for it. I'm calling true crossover, even though it's probably not right. Nine number 17 is a card drafting game with engine building in it. It is It's a Wonderful World. Mm -hmm. No? Dang. No, unfortunately not. Okay. I got to guess on what yours is, but uh, oh, Ooh, wait. interesting. Okay. Uh, it's a Wonderful World is indeed, like I said, a card drafting game where you are going to be uh, taking a card uh, out of a hand. You're going to get to choose one of those cards. You're going to pass the rest of them to your players on your left or right, depending on the round, and you'll receive uh, cards from, from the other player, and then choose another one, and on and on and on you go until you yep. each have seven cards that you have selected. And then you, these cards are all going to be different projects you can build uh, to kind of be added to your empire and stuff. These projects are going to cost a certain amount of resources. There's five resource types in the game, five colors. Um, and if you ever get a card completely covered with the resources it requires to build, that building is now complete. It might give you a, a bonus upon completing it, and then it will go into your empire where it might generate uh, resources during the production phase of every round, mm -hmm. or it might give you kind of some set collection, point scoring stuff, things like that. Yeah. Um, this game is so fun. The more we've played it, we've always been we've always yeah. enjoyed it, and the more you play it, the more. I think you can that you can kind of do you know as yeah. you figure the game out <laughs> because this game is really about balance. Every round you're going to get seven cards, and that's potentially seven projects you could put into construction. It's not going to be possible probably to complete every single card you draw uh, that you select during the draft phase. But every card also has a recycle icon where it will basically you can trash a card to get one resource of whatever color is indicated on that card. Mm -hmm. So this game is all about finding that balance point of like, what can I construct? How many things do I simply recycle for resources to try to construct buildings as quick, you know, these projects as quick as I can? Yeah. Because the quicker they go into your empire, the more they can potentially produce and stuff because you only have four rounds in the game. So there's four production phases. Uh, so it's really about finding like, okay, what do I recycle? What do I choose to build? When you're drafting, be thinking about that. Like I'm looking for cards that have a blue uh, resource yep. for the recyclability because I'm just trying to get this card over here yeah. done this, maybe on construction from the last round or whatever. Uh, and then after you kind of do all of that, you go into a production phase where the resource types, the five colors, produce in a specific order every round. And as you get those resources, you can add them to cards and uh, maybe complete more cards and stuff like that. And if we're producing the gray resource, the first resource, and that allows me to complete a card that produces uh, yellow. When it comes down to yellow later, that card's now in my empire and it produces that very same round, yep. which is really cool. So Super again, satisfying. Cool timing stuff. There's a lot of things where you can kind of stack the scoring of something where it's like, maybe I get two points for every blue card I completed. And if I have two of those, now I'm getting four cards, you know, four points per blue card I complete and stuff like that. So it just rewards you kind of figuring out a direction to go and really hitting it hard. It's just so fun. Uh, yeah, I the more I play it, the more I love it's, it. It's yeah. such now, a I'm good game. Every time I play it, I'm like, I like that more than I did last time. Yeah, and yeah. I think I'm actually decent at the game now, which for the longest yeah. time I could not say. <laughs> you really had a hard time Now for I'm a actually bit. okay at it. <laughs> so that is my uh, 17, It's a Wonderful World. My number 17 is going to be 
I'm gonna say the Great Russian Trail. I knew it. Series. Yeah. I knew it. <laughs> I was the, like, it seems like it's not. I'm like, he's gonna see his Great Russian Trail. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's the Great Russian Trail. I'm gonna say series because I like all three Great Russian Trails. Yeah. They're all pretty similar in terms of how much I like it. If I had to choose one, I would choose Great Russian Trail in New Zealand. I know this. Good guy. call. When you're like, oh yes, it's like I think you probably know what it is. <laughs> Uh, Great Western Trail New Zealand is my favorite of them, but again, the base game is outstanding. So it's just, they're all really they're outstanding. They're all literally so good, dude. Yeah. So uh, Great Western Trail is a game, the original one at least, where you are running cattle and you're running them up to Kansas City where you'll be shipping them off throughout the rest of the U.S. for as pets, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah, um, they live long, happy lives. Yeah, they live long, happy, for sure. Um, and so, yeah, it's, what it is. it's a big rondelle, and a rondelle is a kind of a big, you're kind of making a big circle, and once you get to the end, you go back to the beginning, you kind of go around like that. The end is Kansas City, and it's a deck building game where your deck of cards is going to be these various cattle, and you want to have unique cattle. You want to have not the same type of cattle, because you're trying to diversify. You're like, hey, here's a big yeah. group of different kind of cattle. And as you're going along the, the rondelle, there's different buildings you can stop at. There's like neutral ones, but you can also build your own. These will do a lot of different things. They allow you to buy more cattle. They allow you to buy employees. You can buy conductors who will kind of move your train. You can buy carpenters who are going to build your buildings. And then you can buy wranglers, cowboys, who are going to allow you to get more cows. And so that's what you're doing is you're, you're building your hand of card, trying to make it as unique as possible. So there's a lot of different spots that allow you to like draw cards and then discard cards. And you're basically trying to do that, trying to get the best hand possible for when you get up to Kansas City. You then can turn in that hand of cards and then you get to put one of your discs out from your board basically up to the value of whatever your hand was. So if I had a total of like 14 cattle unique because they have different values to them, I then could put it on something that's 14 or below where I don't already have a disc. It's really, really fun. Um, it's just... It's just interesting, like, and, and, and there's so many different facets of this game where, like, when I first started playing the game, I was like, I'm just going to do cattles. I don't get the buildings. I don't get why people, they, they seem very not that useful. Yeah, the buildings are amazing. And the buildings are amazing. <laughs> there's so much depth to these games. And then they came out with the Rails to the North expansion for it, which kind of made the, the railroad part of it, in my opinion, more interesting and the delivering of cattle more interesting. Really love that expansion. And then they're like, hey, by the way, we're doing a second edition, and we're going to have two more ver versions of this game. We have uh, Argentina. And then New Zealand. Argentina is similar to the game, but has some other stuff going on. Some kind of like delayed shipping, which is really, really interesting. I really like Argentina a lot. Yeah. Um, and they have New Zealand where you are running sheep instead of cattle, because there's not really much of a history of cattle wrangling in New Zealand. No. And that one's kind of like a greatest hits. It's kind of got stuff from Australia, stuff from the Rails of the North expansion, stuff from the base game. It's also like the biggest and like the heaviest of the three. So I wouldn't start with New Zealand, but uh, it is probably my favorite. I also think it's like the prettiest. It's just cool. The sheep are awesome. There's like so much going on in New Zealand. Um, yeah, it's cool. I love Great Western Trail. I'll play any of them. They're all outstanding. Um, and it is my 17 Great Western Trail. Nice. Well done, sir. Let's uh, hop into 16. My number 16 as a game that I really, really like, and this, well, obviously, is my number 16. This is The Lost Ruins of Arnok. I realize how, <laughs> how redundant that sentence sure, was, sure, you know? Sure, sure, The Lost Ruins of Arnok is my number 16. Um, I love The Lost Ruins of Arnok. I love it, love it, love it. Uh, this is a game where you are explorers, uh, and you're kind of exploring a jungle. You're basically trying to find some ruins, so and you're archaeologists. So you're trying to research these ruins. Yeah, looking for evidence of... of uh, you know, yeah, past, past civilizations, that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah, so you're kind of going deeper and deeper and deeper, like into the jungle um, as you go. And this is a game that is all about extending your round as long as possible. And I really love games that do that. Sure. Um, this game is only five rounds in the game, and you're basically trying to stay in the round as long as possible. Because this game is all about like getting stuff, and that stuff's gonna allow you to do other stuff. You're like, oh, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to this spot with my workers, and I'm gonna get these resources. And now this is gonna allow me to bump up the research track. Bumping up the research track gives me this. Now with that, I can now do this. Okay, now that allowed me to do this. Now I can now go over here and do this. And so like, <laughs> you kind of just, especially like once you get to the fourth and fifth round, you just have these ways of just extending and extending. And I really love games where you're just trying to go as far as you possibly can. And so you are taking boats and planes and trucks to different parts of the jungle. You're going to these ruins that you're finding. There are like these, it's kind of interesting because this game is also kind of like not set in the real world because there's literally like, yeah, it's, there's like guardians of these things, but they're like monsters kind of. Yeah, and it's, so like it's like semi-magical. Yeah, it's like semi-fantastical. Kind of part. But I that, like but, that about it. It's like yeah. semi-fantastical. These guardians that overcome these guardians, all those things give you points. You're getting new cards because there's a deck building element to the game. Those are going to be worth points. You're moving up this research track, which is kind of like the main part of the game. It's only kind of drawback I would say is like the research track is like one of the main parts of the game, if not the main part of the game. I think it's the main but part. But it's kind of like, 
off to the side on the board. So it doesn't feel like it's the main part, but it's like, if you're teaching the game, like you need to make sure you do this because right. that's a big part of the game. If you think thematically, like the point is that you're archeologist and these, the research is your, is what you're writing back. Yeah. Like, these are your findings yeah. and stuff. So of course it's the most important thing, but just the way the layout looks, it, it looks less yeah. important than it is. It's yeah. just so good. They've supported the heck out of this game. They came out with one expansion that gave, made everyone asymmetric. Oh, so amazing. Every, and it was just amazing. They came out with a one to two player like campaign, which is like super cool. Oh, amazing. I know they're working on something else because uh, Min and Elwin just post on BG being like, hey, if you want to play test, new Lost Ruins stuff kind of thing. So like, they're not going to stop supporting this game because it does very well for them. And I'm okay with it because I absolutely love it. It's my number 16. Nice. My number 16 is a deduction logic game called Turing Machine. Uh, yeah, I figured this would be really high up for you. Yeah, this yeah. is no uh, surprise. It shouldn't be. I, I talk about Turing Machine a lot and I play it most every day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you really do. This the turtle. Is, yeah, this is, you gotta do the turtle. Uh, this is a game uh, where you are going to be looking for a three number code. Uh, the numbers are all between one and five. There will be a three number uh, sequence and you are going to be basically using this analog computer to ask questions uh, or to seek out you know, more information about what the rules are for the code. So this is gonna be in the form of verifiers. There's basically these verifiers will be between four and six. Uh, usually I play with six and you, uh, they're gonna give you basically rules that the code has to follow, which will allow you to whittle down to one possible answer. There will never be a situation where it's this or that. Uh, there is always w exactly one answer and you will be able to uh, figure that out, uh, hopefully. Uh, so these verifiers are cool because they'll have something where it says like for the yellow number, the second number in the sequence, for the yellow number, uh, the verifier will say it's either you know less than three, equal to three or greater than three. And so you can ask basically questions of this verifier by having your code be one of those three possibilities. Yeah. So if my second number, my yellow number in my code is a two, and I go to check that verifier, I'm asking, hey, is it true that the yellow number is less than three? Because in my code, it's a two. So the code is less than three. If I get a little check mark, that means yes, that is correct. It is less than three. And at that point I can say, well, it's not three, four or five. I know it's either that. one or two. And I have a, a narrower window of what these things can be. Yep. And you can kind of cross check based on the other verifiers. There might be one where it's uh, the blue number, the first number in the sequence and the yellow number. Uh, does, if you add those together, are they less than six, equal to six, or greater than six? Well, it's like, okay, if the, if the yellow has to be one or two, it's not super likely, well, I know for one, it's not very likely that it's higher than six, right. the blue would have to be a five and stuff, and, and so you can do some like cross-checking like that yeah. to get to the answer. It's insanely satisfying yes. to whittle stuff down, and where you have that kind of cascading moment where you're like, okay, well, I know that there has to be more odd numbers than even, so that means that uh, you know, my middle number is an even, so that means these two can't be even, so that you get to like cross out a bunch of stuff all at once just based on certain things you've checked off. Yeah. And it's super satisfying to do. It's just physically really cool because you create this little stack it's as your It's one code of the coolest things in all of board games. That yeah. has like all these holes in it and stuff and it creates one window and you use these, uh, these other cards to verify. So again, it's like an analog computer. Yeah. But it has no electronic component, which is just like, fascinating it's that wild. like physically it can work <laughs> it works really great on board game arena as well yeah um it's never not fun to yeah. solve those puzzles and so uh i love it so much and that's why some of this turing machine what's number 15 mike my number 15 is liz bowen nick oh wow that's pretty high that's awesome yeah man uh, this you is, do love some Lisboa. I do love some Lisboa. Yeah. yeah, I can see this even climbing higher Me too, for you. I want to crack it. I feel I like know, I right? cracked it yet, yeah. but I really enjoy what it is. Uh, so Lisboa is uh, a big old Euro game. Big <laughs> who could have guessed it? Um, by uh, Vitala Serda, who uh, is known for making you know big, big old heavy, Euro games, crunchy yeah. <laughs> games with a lot of stuff going on, and Lisboa is certainly like one of the heaviest of of uh, Lacerda's games. Uh, this is a game where you are in Portugal and stuff uh, right after <laughs> this massive earthquake hit, which, uh, of course, did a bunch of damage to the buildings in, the, in Lisbon and caused fires to break out and then also caused a tsunami. <laughs> uh, and so there's massive flooding in the city. 
and we kind of jump into the game right after all of that, and we are rebuilding the city. We are, we are, you know, trying to get everything back up and running again. So, uh, in the kind of market section of the board, you'll have a bunch of rubble cubes, and you want to build buildings out there in the market. So, if we have to clear out rubble first and stuff, and then kind of use that rubble to to build with yeah. and things, might as well reuse uh, it to make better for the future. Um, you are kind of doing all this stuff through card play. You have your kind of player board, your portfolio, and you're gonna be playing these cards above and below your player board uh, to take actions, get bonuses, discounts, and things like that. And you are kind of going up to uh, these nobles a lot of the time to uh, you know, make use of them. You're going asking, hey, can I get a little, you know, something, something they're gonna help you out with rebuilding. Hey, <laughs> and you're kind of trying to be kind of one of the most, you know, notable people, yeah. uh, you know, by kind of rubbing elbows with those nobles and things like that. Um, this is a game that I just really enjoy for, there's so many like opportunities mm -hmm. for things. There's these clergy tiles you can get, which will give you, you know, these opportunities for scoring stuff and things like that. There's the ability to, you know, slot cards beneath your board or above your board, depending on which ones you draft, um, you know, to, to figure all this stuff out. You can build these buildings in this market and stuff and then hope to kind of gain benefits by the rows and columns you're in later. Uh, all this and more. There's really a lot going on. So it's one that I've always been intrigued by. We played it once way back in the day and I played it a couple times more recently. Uh, and it's one that I just really want to keep exploring and keep trying to figure out like how to get better at. It's yeah. just, I've, I don't know. I've been uh, enamored with this yeah. one for a while. When we kind of started going into Lacerda games, Lisboa was the reason why I wanted to start exploring yeah. these heavier games because of the memory of the first time I played yeah. it. Which is a long time um, ago now, yeah. Long time ago. And uh, it's just really great. So yeah, looks it great, is. you know, tool art. Uh, yeah, Lacerda is fantastic. So that's my 15th Lisboa. My number 15 is a game I'm very into right now. Uh, and I think it's going to stay this way as long as we can play it somewhat often. And this is going to be Hooky. Uh, shouts out to Jamie from Baby. Boston the Meeple. Hooky is... This game is, hurts my head, man. I love this game. I would play this game every single day if I could. I wish it was an app because I would play it every single... I might overplay it, though, is the problem. So Hooky is a deduction game. We, like dedu have, we have though. found that we really like deduction games as yep. time has gone by. Uh, uh, Hooky is a deduction game where you are trying to deduce... Which three kids are not in class? So yep. two, three kids are playing hooky. Yeah, here. There are 26 kids because there are um, uh, every kid has a name that starts with a letter of the alphabet. So like Sarah or Mike or Nick or something like that. So there's one for every letter of the alphabet. And then to play, and so there's gonna be three that are playing hooky. Those will be face down, so we obviously can't see them. You're trying to figure out what those ones are. Um, and how you do that is you're going to be asking other people a five-letter word. It's essentially kind of like competitive Wordle, yep. uh, which is awesome. <laughs> it's I love Wordle and competitive Wordle. Music amazing. to my ears. Yeah, <laughs> real talk. So basically, but how you deduce it is because every person, depending on the player count, you're going to get a certain amount of these kids. You're going to get a certain amount of letters. So I might be like the letters I have are like A, J, N, Z. And L. Those are the ones I have. So I know for a fact that those five are not the three kids playing hooky. We know that for, I know that for a fact. No one else knows that, but I know that. So then everyone has letters. So what you're going to do is you're going to ask people a five letter word like Mike, how about uh, crush? C-R-U-S-H. And then what Mike will do is he'll look at his letters and he's going to say how many matches that makes for him. So let's say Mike had C and R. He'd say two. And everyone, by the way, is hearing this. Yep. So everyone goes, okay, that cr you write down crush and two for Mike. You're like, okay. You don't know which two necessarily. So that means two of those are Mike's. You're like, okay, so like that means da da da. Now, but maybe I have the H. So like, well, I know it's not the H because I have the H. Yep. So that narrows it down even more. And so it's this fascinating thing. And then also if there's a double, let's say it was like brass, B-R-A-S-S, -S, and Mike was, the A, Mike was the S, he would say two matches because there's two S's. Yep. So it can get kind of weird with that. But so basically you're asking these questions. So it's fascinating because you, one, you're trying to deduce, I love deduction games, but you're also trying to think of good words. Because you're like, I think Mike is like K, Y, and like something else. You're like, oh, what about like yucky? Like Y-U-C-K-Y. -Y. And then you're like, Okay, that and then it matches three. You're like, okay, cool. I think it's two Y's and I think it's a K because that's what I, and you're deducing. And then as the game goes on, three times the game, there's three other cards that are out and they're going to get flipped over. Um, and those cards are going to be essentially 
cards like R gets flipped over. Now everyone knows that the R is not the one playing hooky. Yeah, so everyone so gets a little bit more A little bit more information. And so that's what you're doing. You're trying to figure out who's playing hooky. It's just, if you like deduction games, if you like word games, this game is an absolute slam dunk. And I'm just so obsessed cool. with it right now. I would play it every single day if I could. I love it. I want to play it over and over and over again. I love hooky. Shouts out to Jamie. It's cool. number 15. Number 14 for me is definitely a... a Nostalgic choice, but I still love it. And this is Suburbia. Nice. Suburbia is still this high. I mean, I think every other I time we play it bad, man. It's, it's been too long. Too long. It's Such been way game, too dude. long. It's so good. It's usually my top 10. It dropped out a little bit because as we were just saying, we don't play it too much anymore. Um, but I just, I love Suburbia. Suburbia has always been, it was one of the first games we played um, that was like a proper like hobby game. We had played like Pandemic, I think like Zombie Side, maybe like one or two other games, maybe. And then I played Suburbia. Yep. And this was the first kind of Euro game that I'd played, the first like tile placement game I played. And I was just like, what is this world? Like this is a world of board games I'd never seen before. And this is a game where you're building out a suburb. Um, and you're gonna do that by kind of buying these hexagonal tiles. And those hexagonal tiles will be something in a suburb, like a gas station or like a fast food place, or like just like housing or like a office building, things that'll be just in the suburb, right? And then you're placing them in your borough, your neighborhood, and where you place stuff matters because on these tiles, it'll be what it is, but then it'll also have some things that it'll give you. The two things that you'll be getting is income and then reputation. So people spending money in your suburbs and then the reputation of your suburbs, your reputation is going to give you population, which is the points of the game because the higher the reputation, the more people that are gonna move in basically. So, you're trying to increase those things. You're trying to increase your income, increase your reputation. And so there's all this adjacency stuff where if like you have a fast food place, a fast food place wants to be next to green tiles because green tiles are like housing. You want them next right. to people who are going to be eating food. You don't necessarily want them next to like a freeway because there's not necessarily people like living there. You want them next to this because it might be like, oh, this tile is one income plus it'll get plus one income for every green tile connected to it. So that way you get a whole big boost of income. And then, but as the game goes, as you're gaining more and more population, your suburb is getting bigger and bigger, which means it's essentially kind of losing that small suburb vibe. So you kind of pass these red lines and that knocks down your reputation and your income. So as you're, getting, you're growing, you're constantly getting knocked down. You're having to kind of rebuild it, rebuild it. It's just so fun. I still to this day find the adjacency part of it super interesting. Everything makes sense. Like if you have an airport next to a green tile, which again is like a housing tile, you're gonna get negative one reputation because it's super loud and no one wants to live next to that. There's like a slaughterhouse because you know people gotta eat meat and you don't want that anywhere near housing because people are like, that's a bummer. <laughs> you know, it's a, whereas you want like a freeway next to office buildings because who's going there? People who are going to work. It's just fascinating to me. To this day, I still think it's incredibly well done. I love the game, but man, this game blew my gourd when we first played it. I was yeah. just like, I had never, ever seen or heard of something like this and I still love it that much. I love it, love it, love it. Suburbia is number 14. Nice, well done. Yeah, it's such a good game. We need to play it more often for sure. For number sure. 14 is a, um, a redo of a game uh, that borrows from a game I mentioned earlier, It's a Wonderful World. This is Shipwrights of the North Sea. Oh, Redux. I was like, what? Wow, the that's new awesome. version of Shipwrights of the North Sea. It's so good. It's so fun. So I just mentioned It's a Wonderful World and how much I enjoy that. And Shipwrights of the North Sea Redux, the new version of the Garfield game, uh, which was always kind of, it was, you know, Shem Phillips' first game. The original first, Shipwrights. I should say, first yeah. major game. And it was seen as kind of the weakest. And so Shem decided to kind of redo it. Uh, and borrowed from some of the stuff that from that he liked from It's a Wonderful World, something that he openly said like we, he was inspired by. So in this game, you are still trying to build long ships uh, in the North Sea Trilogy, and you are doing this through card drafting. So you're going to be drafting out cards uh, that are going to have all different types of things. There are long ships. There are buildings, which give you worker placement spaces. Mm -hmm. There are townsfolk, which can be kind of used once and then discarded or can be attached to a building to modify what that building does. There are your Jarls, which will help you bump up these tracks and give you gold, potentially. Uh, there are, I think those are all the types. Uh, uh, craftspeople, which help you build your longships. Yeah. 
things like that. You're going to be drafting these out until you have a big hand of cards. Yeah. Uh, and then you are going to be choosing, again, similar to It's a Wonderful World, what to do with these cards. Like I said, your townsfolk, you can simply discard them to do their ability one time, but then they go away. Or if you have a gold and a building that's been built, you can spend a gold to tuck them under that building and those buildings are worker placement spots. Mm -hmm. So now I can go to a worker placement spot that says, uh, you know, spend a silver to gain a worker. Uh, and you can maybe on the bottom, it says, hey, turn in a worker to get two gold. And so it's like, okay, now I can do that all in one, have a really yeah. synergistic building. The buildings will also give you points and stuff, but ultimately you wanna be producing these resources and using these workers to build your long ships. Your long ships are gonna cost a ton of resources. They're gonna use these craftspeople as well because you need to have certain skills. Yeah. Uh, and they're gonna give you, you know, a powerful instant ability. They're gonna move you up these three types of tracks. They are going to give you uh, potentially end game scoring, for, like one, you know, that says for every different type of building you have, uh, you gain, you know, X points yeah. uh, and things like that. So that's kind of the main thing you're doing is trying to funnel these massive amounts of resources into these ships to kind of uh, generate as much scoring as you can at the end of the game. It's very good. It's super fun. The thing, the main thing that, that I enjoy <clears throat> is that there's all these different types of cars and there's, there's all these opportunities there's for so things many. to do. I love that there's worker placement spots and there's many things that when you build, you have to spend workers out of your out of your supply and back to the main supply. But if you use workers on worker placement spots, they come back to you at the end of the round. So you yeah. get to kind of like use them again and again, potentially. Uh, there's just a lot of avenues to explore. And each card also has a discard ability where if you discard it, you might get like a single resource or a worker or a couple money or the ability to draw a different townsfolk yeah. card. So I feel like there's a ton of mitigation. There's so much, yeah. It's like, I don't quite have what I want. Well, let me ditch this card to draw a new townsfolk card. Maybe that gives me something a little bit better. Yeah. And you just are trying to do as much as you can in each round. It's, it's so mostly good. simultaneous play. It is very uh, multiplayer very, solitaire. Yeah. It works great as solo for that reason. Because yeah. like, then I'm not worried about holding anyone else's yeah. day up. Um, it just takes a lot of the great stuff that I love from It's a Wonderful World and puts it into a theme and gives you a, a wider variety of what these cards do. Because yeah. in It's a Wonderful World, all those cards are just different projects. Yes. And this, there's like all sorts, sorts of, of stuff to do. Yeah, this it's was so like, fun. I think in my 60s or something like that, I think this is going to climb for me for yeah. sure as we play it more. I I love this game. It's, I love it so much. That's my uh, 14 is Shipwrights of the North Sea Redux. My 13 was mentioned by you earlier in this list. This is Great Western yeah. Trail. Again, I think it'd be a little bit higher. Not a yeah. ton, but a little bit higher. Similarly, uh, uh, when I say Great Western Trail, I do refer to all the versions. The trilogy. The trilogy, called, yeah. the Great Western Trilogy. Um, New Zealand is my favorite of those. Uh, but I play you know, regular Great Western Trail all the time on Board Game Arena, and I like them all so much. Uh, all the things that you mentioned are, are really great. I just think that there's more to this game than you than you think originally. Yes, it is. And there are, I think, if you kind of go one of the directions hard enough, if it is, you know, running cattle, if it's building buildings and making use of those, or, uh, you know, working on your train, or if you're in uh, <laughs> New Zealand on your ships and stuff, there's a lot of ways to, to get points and a lot of things you can do. Uh, New Zealand is just cool because cool. those sheep, uh, have their breeding value as normal and you can go up to Wellington and deliver or they also have their shearing value. You can shear them and it's an, and deliver wool. So there's a lot of spaces that will give you the ability to deliver the sheep themselves or just deliver their wool. Yeah, which is really nice to have so a separate So there's like thing. more options there, which is really cool. Yeah. And like maybe I build out my hand of sheep in a different way because I'm, I'm looking for their shearing for value wool. Yeah. first and foremost. Yeah. Um, Th that's really cool. The Argentina version is really cool um, in that you have like the strength of the cows and stuff and you can get uh, farmers, the Grand Harrows and stuff and like there's just a lot of stuff. So again, everything Nick said, I agree. Great Western Trail is my uh, 13. My 13 is a game that's always around this, around the top 10. This is uh, Grand Austria Hotel. Nice. Uh, Grand Austria Hotel is so good. It's, it's, just, we actually just got the, the roll and write version, which is also very good, which is nice. Yeah. Grand Austria Hotel, you are running a hotel in Grand Austria, obviously. Um, <laughs> Grand old Austria. Grand old Austria. So yeah, so you are running a hotel. Uh, you're a hotelier. And basically what's going to be happening is you're going to be getting guests. These guests, at the bottom of your hotel, there is a cafe. You're going to have guests that come into your cafe. They're going to want certain things. They're going to want like cake, strudel, uh, wine, or coffee. 
And if you serve them what they want, they will then stay in your hotel, which I personally think is a hilarious thematic thing. Like they yeah. like have no idea where they're gonna stay, but if you feed them what they want, then they'll stay there. I just think it's really funny. I think it's nice to know that like where you're staying, you also have bomb food, so you don't yeah. have to go anywhere. It's just in the world where like you always reserve stuff beforehand nowadays. It's just yeah. such a funny concept, but like <laughs> nonetheless. So then they'll come up to you. All these uh, guests have different color kind of um, identifications. They're blue, yellow, red, or green. So blue guests have to go into blue rooms, uh, red into red, yellow to yellow and green can kind of go anywhere. They also have something on the bottom of them that's gonna give you something when you, when you put them into a room. And so obviously you can also uh, build out your hotel. So your hotel, you can essentially open up different rooms, different colors that you wanna do. You can close those rooms, essentially put guests into them. There's an emperor track that you can go up to because the emperor is gonna come and inspect your hotel and you're about to make sure it looks good. All these different things, but really what it boils down to is the way you do your actions in this game. There's a big old pile of die and you roll all the dice out and then you assign them their pip values, one through six. And then on your turn, you can essentially take a die from one of those values and that value is gonna be attached to an action. So like number one is getting cake and strudel. Number two is getting wine and coffee. Number three is opening rooms, so on and so forth. And the strength of that action is equal to how many dice are there. So if I do the open a room action and I take one there and there's five dice there, which is a lot, I can then open five rooms. Now you need to have money to do things like that. So it's not necessarily like it's just free, but you're like, oh, I have like, I can do five things. So a lot of times you're like, man, I have a lot of people who need wine. Everyone's trying to get wine drunk on a Tuesday morning. You know it. I need wine. And then you roll like zero twos and you're just like, oh, there's no, I can't get any wine, holy crap. <laughs> and it's really tough. So this game is basically doing what you can with what gets rolled. Because yeah. sometimes you're like, oh great, I needed a bunch of these, there's a bunch of dice here, this is awesome. There's definitely some ways to mitigate it, like sixes can basically be anything. So you can like mitigate it a little bit, but it tends to be really tough, really brutal. And it's just very, very fun. But it is a tough game, so if you're not into that, then definitely you know watch out for it. But I still, Really, really love it. We've had it for years, played it for years, and it's still really great. So that is my number uh, 13. Let's get a 12. My number 12 is Boon Lake. Ooh. I don't care. It's apparently my favorite Fister game, Alexander Fister game. I love Boon Lake. Yeah. Boon Lake is kind of one of those divisive ones, I guess. I We love it, though. We, it was on Mike's yeah. a couple lists ago. Like, I love Boon I mean, Lake. Boon Lake. <laughs> You are in kind of like the old west kind of like uh, frontier stuff, and you're kind of sure. like uh, uh, explorers. Call, I was know? gonna say call that call that's wrong. There's no one there, luckily. Yeah, you're kind of explorers. <laughs> you're, you're settling is the word I'm trying to say. Yeah, so you're settling this land, um, and then basically how you do it is you do it through these actions. Uh, one of the main drawbacks this game has is that it's very long. At yeah. two players, it's not too too long, but it usually is like two hours. So I was only ever played it two, and I just don't really mind the length of the game. But nonetheless, you're choosing an action. The action is gonna be like playing cards, putting out tiles, you can put out pastures, which will have cows. You can put out buildings. You can then upgrade those buildings into like, it's like a building and then it's a town and then it's a full on settlement, things like that. Um, you can do these actions, but the cool thing is, is whatever action you choose, there's almost always going to be a follow action, which means you're gonna get to do this really, really cool thing. And then everyone else is gonna do a similar action, but kind of a lesser version of it. I love games with follow mechanics. I just always think it makes, I think it makes it more interesting because you're just always engaged in what's happening because you're like, oh, Mike's doing this big cool turn, but I also get to do something too. That's really, really nice. Um, it's just really, really fun. There's a bunch of cards. The cards will give you like ongoing powers where it's like, oh, now every time you do this, you're just gonna get some money. You're gonna do this. They have end game scoring. There's a whole bunch of different cards. Um, there's many copies of the same card, but you can have multiple copies. Sometimes you can get a couple of these actions that are just like super strong. We're yeah. like, oh, every time I put a cow out, I'm getting to like draw three cards. I get a whole bunch of money. I get a whole, I'm getting all these things because awesome. I just have a whole bunch of cards that deal with putting cows out. It's just really, really good. I freaking love this game. I just love it. I don't know why. I'm just like, char there's nothing, the thing about the game is there's nothing I can really point to of like, this is why I like this game. But I just do. Like, yeah. I just, the way it all comes together, I just really, really enjoy. There's like this kind of racing element where you're racing down the river that times out the game. So like that's, there's just so many, in my opinion, there's so many different 
interesting design spaces. There's so many interesting uh, decision spaces. We're like, oh, what action I do? That's an interesting decision space. The kind of like, how much do I want to go down the river? That's an interesting decision space. There's so many of these little things that, in my opinion, just come together in a really fun game. I really like Boone Lake. Again, it's kind of device. So people either really like it or really don't seem to like it. And we are kind of become slightly evangelists for this game. I freaking love it. Boone Lake is my number 12. Nice. Uh, my number 12 is a worker placement game. Can you tell? that I like worker placement Euro games. It also uses uh, tile laying and stuff, and it's a former number one. No, it dropped out of your top 10? It's a feast for Odin, number 12. Oh my god! This is why I told Nick when I ranked my games that I was shook up I by figured, what happened. I, I thought, when you were talking about how shook you were, I thought it was maybe you're not your number one. It dropped out of your top 10? Barely, it's number 12. I mean, it's right there. It's basically the top 10 plus, you know? I'm freaked out by it. So wow. ship, uh, A Feast for Odin is a Viking-themed worker <laughs> placement 11. game. I'm gonna close my eyes while I don't wanna look at people. I don't want it to shame. Uh, it's a big old worker placement game from Uwe Rosenberg where you have uh, a ton of action spots that are in kind of four columns or five columns with the expansion, which is what we play with. And these columns are going to, uh, going to be different kind of strengths of types of actions where they will take one, two, three, or four workers. If you place a spot on a four worker spot, you have to use more of your workers, which will maybe make your round shorter, but you get a much more powerful yeah. action than if you were to do a one worker action spot. The area of the board is broken up into different areas of like getting resources, kind of, you know, hunting for uh, food and things like that, building buildings building ships, going out and exploring uh, distant islands, raiding and pillaging and doing Viking stuff. And all of these things are sort of going to comprise of you gaining tiles. And the tiles, there's various shapes. There's, you know, all the kind of standard shapes and then some funky polyomino kind of one-off unique uh, tiles as well. And these tiles are gonna basically be available in four colors. They're gonna be in orange, red, green, then blue. And they are sort of the hierarchy of of that from low to high. If they are orange or red, they're gonna be food items which you're gonna to use to feed your Vikings, but you can't put out on your main board. Uh, and green are gonna be different uh, goods and things that you produce. Uh, and you can upgrade them to blue. And the reason why, why, why you might wanna upgrade to blue is on your player board that you're filling out, you can't ever have green touching green. You have to have green and blue kind of offsetting. Blue's wild and can go anywhere. So you're kind of working on upgrading tiles, gaining tiles, getting them onto your player board and generating income and various things like that to cover up basically all the negatives that are yeah. on your board and Of which stuff. there's a lot. <laughs> of which there's a lot. It's scary the first time you play this. You're like, yeah. oh, that's so many negative points. Yeah. But uh, you basically are trying to fill out your player board as much as possible. There's ways you can get unique tiles that are also considered to be like blues. So they can touch anything, go anywhere. And there's just a million and one options. It's very sandboxy, yes. which is why I've loved this game and still love it, by the way. Sure doesn't, though. Uh, is, is There's just all these things to explore and all these opportunities, and it's never uh, never really gets old. So yeah. super duper fun. You mentioned it uh, before on your list and stuff. My number 12. I still love it, okay? So it's just number yeah. 12, Feast for Odin. Wow. What game, Mike, what trash game just missed your top 10? I feel bad about it, Nick. You just mentioned this game. This is the Grand Austria Hotel. Oh, yeah. Just outside. Just of outside. Kitchen, but they're so close. I know. It's usually my top 10, too, but it's just, I'd love it. I mean, it obviously. just got pushed out by two games. I'm looking at those games right now. Grand Austria Hotel is, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I keep following up Nick. Yeah, so I know. Yeah, it's as kinda... Nick just said about Grand Austria <laughs> Hotel, uh, apply to me. Uh, I love the fact that you are beholden to these dice that get rolled, uh, it, but there's so many ways to work with yep. stuff. There is that mirror action. You can just trash a die and kind of like Re yeah. forego your turn, and then at the end of the round, you can take all those trash dice and roll those. So if you like really want to try to yeah. get that two that you were mentioning for your wine, uh, alcoholic, uh, <laughs> you can re-roll those dice and stuff. So there's all these ways to work with what you got, and yeah. you are just sort of always under the gun. The Emperor's coming around to check up on you, so you just need to be kind of pushing all areas. Yeah. Uh, and it's just a wonderfully satisfying, like, th that good stress kind of game where you'll be really frustrated, but, like, you'll love the game for that frustration yeah. it creates instead of, like, this game is broken or something like that, uh, which is a great podcast you should great subscribe podcast. to. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, Grand Austria Hotel is my number 11. It's just outside the top 10, yeah. but, man, it's, it's an all-timer. It's just an all-timer. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, it's been around for a long time. My number 11 is a deduction game. It's another one, uh, and this is called Paint the Roses. 
Yeah. yeah. Paint the Roses is a cooperative deduction game. Uh, as we, as I said earlier when I was talking about Hookie, I have found, I used to not like deduction games yeah. because they made, used to make me feel stupid, but I guess I'm a genius now. <laughs> so that's useful for me, um, being a genius. And so uh, I just think this game is a masterpiece. I, I really do. Yeah. I just think it's so good. This is a game, I, I feel like we talk about this game all the time. It just, it, this is one of those games that like, finds, a, it finds its way on every list we make. Like yeah. kind of seems like no matter what list we do, a top ten list, Paint the Rose somehow is always. I'm sure people are very tired of hearing it about this. Yeah, point. sorry about that. Don't but we care. like it that much. <laughs> love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. This is a game, a cooperative production game where you are in the Alice in Wonderland universe and um, you are trying to make the Red Queen's garden, and she has very specific ways she wants it to be made. She's obviously a very reasonable person. Everyone knows that about the Red Queen. Yep. And famously um, patient. Famously patient. She has a big axe to make sure that you're doing this stuff. Yep. And basically, she has told you how she wants her garden to be laid out, but she told all of you only parts of the garden. Like, she's like, hey, by the way, I want purple roses next to pink roses. Hey, I want hedges that look like spades next to heads that, hedges that look like clubs. Um, because there are four different color of roses, four different shapes of hedges, which are in the shapes of the suits of the cards. So, um, hey, Mary. Um, and so basically, you're gonna have these whim cards, which is again, what the queen wants. And that whim card will say like, purple roses next to yellow roses. What you're doing in your turn is you're gonna take a tile, you're gonna place it out onto um, the board. And then if you made any matches for your whim, so basically the tiles are gonna have hedges and then um, flowers on them. I need purple to yellow, right? So if I put a, a hedge, a thing down, a tile, and I made a match with, now there's purple next to yellow, I will put one of my cubes out there and say, hey, this makes a match for my whim. So if I put it next to, say there's a spot with like three purple flowers, I put a spot, put a thing with yellow, I just made three matches for myself. So I put down three. And that basically people go like, oh, I think Nick's whim is purple to yellow because it can't be this, it can't be that because it's not enough matches. The only thing that can be three matches is purple to yellow. So that's what you're doing. But the cool thing is, is when I put out a tile, it might make a match for Mike's whim because Mike's whim might be like, you want diamond hedges next to red flowers. And it turns out that like, there's also that there. So Mike's like, oh, oh, by the way, that made a match for me too. At the end of every turn, you have to guess. You have to make a guess of someone's whim. If you get it correct uh, on the whim, there'll be a certain amount of spaces and your gardener will move up that many spaces on the track. And then the queen will move a certain amount. If you get it wrong, the queen's still gonna move. You're not, but the queen's gonna move double. And there are easy, medium, and hard whims. They will give you more, um, more points of movement the higher they are, but they're also gonna be harder to guess because easy ones are always color to color. It's always flower to flower, color to color. Medium are always hedge to hedge, but um, hard could either be color to color, hedge to hedge, or hedge to color. So if Mike has a hard whim, you're kind of like, oh, that could be a lot of different things. It's so much fun. There's like all these expansions for it, all these so models. Much. I'll tell you right now, I've never played any of them because <laughs> I love the base game that much. I'm still trash at the base yeah, game. Yeah, I don't think you need the expansions. Maybe, I really don't think you do. I think they're great if you want them, but like to me, I'm like, I have such a hard time with this game anyway that like the queen speeds up throughout the game. It's really hard to stay in front of her. I lose this game way, way more than I win, but I just absolutely love it. Paint the Roses is so, so good. It's my number 11. I can see even going higher. It's just that good. Um, I love Paint the Roses, my number 11, and that's the end of this list, y'all. End of the list, everybody. Oh. If you've been watching along with us, thank you so much. It's, of course, easiest to jump to the 10 to 1, which will be the next video. Yes. Uh, but we really love talking about all these games because literally anything on this top 100 on our top 200 are amazing games. Yeah. We love them so much. So it's fun to talk about the ones that just missed just that missed top the 10. You know, the, the coveted top 10 I know, right? Spot. This one, this is always a tough <laughs> list because, like, man, these are just outside. But, hey. All right, so we'll be back with our next top 10. 10 to 1. Make sure to check out Kickstarter if you haven't already. Please Make do. sure to continue writing in your top games as you're going through this list. And we'll see you all later. Bye. Thank you so much for watching that latest installment of our top 100. We're getting there, folks. 20 to 11. Ooh, we're almost up to that 10 to 1. Make sure to check out the other installments if you haven't already on the right side of your screen. Big shout out to our channel sponsors, Restoration Games, Garfield Games, and Board Game Geek. Love y'all to death. Let's do this.